The week four preview episode of the Bears Talk Underground is brought to you by my bookie. Remember, guys, who you're betting on is just as important as who you're betting with. That's why I'll always tell people to bet with my bookie. Trust me, they are your best bet this season. They've been in business for years. They have some of the best reviews online, and their mobile site is so easy to use. So I am urging you to make your way to my bookie. You win, they pay. They have in-game live betting, over-unders on fantasy points scored, and the most rewarding perks in the business. My bookie is currently getting slammed with new bettors and wants to give everyone the best service possible. And if you're willing to make a deposit after 7 p.m. Eastern time, they'll give you an additional $25 in free play on deposit to over $100. Join now and MyBookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar. Use the promo code BEARS25 to activate the offer. Visit MyBookie online today. That's MyBookie, M-Y-B-O-O-K-I-E. And don't forget to use the promo code BEARS25 when creating your account to claim up $1,000 in free play. And if you're willing to hold out until after 7 p.m., you know, uh, wait until the, the Thursday night game kicks off. Like when the Vikings and the Rams get it on tonight, you get an extra $25 free play by using the promo code BEARS25. So it's up to you guys, but I'd wait until after the game kicks off to get that extra money. My bookie, you play, you win, you get paid. This week on the Bears Talk Underground. It hasn't been pretty, but our beloved are on a two-game winning streak and sitting atop the NFC North Division awaiting a visit from the also first place Tampa Bay Buccaneers in a battle between two and one teams looking to head into their bye weeks with their third victory of the season. But what do the Bears need to look out for and can victory be attained? Brent Allen and Ren Dax of the Pewtercast podcast join us on the week four preview episode of the Bears Talk Underground. Week number four, closing the book on the first quarter of the season. Man, I mean, you guys probably hear me say this every single season, but good God, we just got this bad boy started. We're, we've already got, uh, you know, three games in the books, and we're getting ready to close out the first quarter and, and go into our bye week already. This is just happening too fast. I mean, we, we piss and we moan and we complain about the, the, the off season being too long, and then when we come back, We're complaining and pissing and moaning that the season is too short. I mean, even as the season is on, like we got the thing that we wanted and we're still complaining. So I guess football fans aren't happy unless they're miserable. I guess that's what we're saying. So anyway, welcome Larry D back for the week four preview episode of the Bears Talk Underground. And um, our good friends Brent Allen and Ren Dax will be joining us from the Pewtercast podcast to help us preview this week's matchup between the surprising two and one teams i mean um we as bear fans felt good about the direction uh, of the team and what the possibilities were and then our expectations our hopes and dreams were elevated quite significantly after the khalil mack trade and then you know we've been nothing but gushing over what this man has done since joining the team from literally the first moment he took the field uh, up until now the bears are two and one because of it and we're a you know a second half collapse away from being an undefeated team uh, right now. So I mean it's uh, it's crazy. And then on the other side, um, you'll hear me t- talk about this to 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 Brent and Ren is that when when Ren and I talked over the summer, uh, we were talking about the very real possibility that this matchup could be one where the two teams combine for maybe one victory. You know um, the Saints, excuse me, the uh, the Bucks had the Saints, the Steelers, and the Eagles to start the year. The Bears on the road against Green Bay, home for Seattle, and then on the road at Arizona. Thinking at the time that a uh, you know having to play against uh, Rodgers and Russell Wilson to start the year before going on the road to face the uh, the Cardinals wasn't completely out of the bo- out of the out of the box thinking that the Bears could be one and two. Uh, right now and 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 not even crazy that it would be 0 and three instead uh both teams with two victories the bears half uh, you know a bad half of football away from three and oh and you could really say the same thing about the buccaneers if not for their first half disaster against the steelers where the steelers were up like 30 to 13 at halftime or 30 to 6 at halftime whatever it was they could as well be three and oh uh coming into this game uh, as well so very intriguing possibilities with this game we talk about it at length with with Brent uh, and Ren so I'm not going to take up too much time here to uh, 
you know, with the with the start of the uh, the show because we cover a lot uh, in the interview tonight. So, just some quick uh, news and notes. Almost all of it injury uh, related. Uh, just read a nice little article on uh, AM sixty or six seven six seventy the AM, the score the score dot com uh, talking about Adam Shaheen. There's a name we haven't really talked about in a while. Uh, saying that he is progressing well uh, from the ankle injury that he suffered in the second preseason game uh, against the uh, Denver Broncos. He was put on the short-term IR or the IR with designation to return or whatever it's officially called. He can come back is basically what it boils down to and saying that he is progressing. Uh, He's not going around on the little Razor scooter that he had to use before. Uh, He's walking under his own power now. He's got a boot on the ankle so obviously he's not moments away from being on the field but um he doesn't have to or he can't come back until after week eight so here we are only week four he's still got four weeks and uh to 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 get better and he's progressing well enough that he looks to be right on track to possibly be ready to be activated in time for uh week nine i suppose it would be so let that's good to hear that uh, he will get a chance to play in the second half of the uh, season. And the more targets for Mitch Trubisky and company, the better. So looking forward and hoping that um, the progression is, is uh, you know, that keeps going and that there are no setbacks so we get him back uh, for 2018. And then basically uh, the only other thing worth talking about is the actual injury report itself. Uh, let's talk about our opponents first. Uh, we do cover a little bit with the guys uh, and from the pewter cast, but, uh, Bo Allen, um, let's see, Bo Allen is the only one that hasn't practiced yet, uh, for the Buccaneers, a defensive tackle, uh, was with Philadelphia last year. Uh, he's got a foot injury that he hasn't practiced yet with on Wednesday or Thursday, uh, tackle DeMar Dotson, uh, Gerald McCoy, defensive tackle. There's a guy we need to keep an eye on a bicep injury. Um, Vita Vea, their number one pick has yet to see the field just yet. Uh, with a calf injury right now, and Marcus Williams, cornerback, a hamstring injury. All three, four of those guys, Dotson, um, Dotson, McCoy, Vea, and Williams have all been limited so far um, this week on Wednesday and Thursday. And Isaiah Johnson, the safety, and Jordan Whitehead, safety, ironically, both with shoulder injuries, have been full participation thus far. On our side of the coin, yeah. Not good. Uh, Prince of Mukamura, Marcus Cooper, uh, both with hamstring injuries, have yet to practice yet this week. And uh, Marcus, or excuse me, DeAndre Houston Carson has been full participation. As a matter of fact, he was off of the injury report today. And Anthony Miller, it was um, it was said to be a um, dislocated shoulder. He will not require surgery, but he hasn't practiced yet. He is most likely doubtful. Uh, for Saturday, or excuse me, for Sunday, which means that he is most, that right now, doubtful means you're 75% not going to play. So not looking good uh, for Anthony Miller to get back out on the field. Maybe this will be the big chance for uh, Kevin White uh, to find his way onto the field and uh, make a little bit of noise uh, and and contribute uh, to the team. Because ironically, um, he did have a a not so bad uh, preseason. Um, we are at risk of going deeper into the season with a healthy Kevin White than we ever have uh, in the history of him being on this football team. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, will this be the 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 game that that Kevin White can uh, can come back and, and do something, or or will somebody else step up? Will Javon Wims get a shot if if uh, Anthony Miller uh, doesn't play? There's an interesting question. So, but nonetheless, uh, not looking good for the young rookie to. Uh, see the field on Sunday uh, against the Buccaneers. And then finally, some very exciting new guy, news, guys. I, um, I don't know if you guys follow me on Twitter, and you should, uh, BTU underscore Larry for the, uh, for the new Bears Talk Underground um, Twitter account. Um, I've kind of been updating people, you, my followers, on the progress I've been making with this uh, book. Uh, it is called the... Um, Football for a Buck, The Crazier Rise and Crazier Demise of the USFL, the old United States Football League, that spring league back in the uh, 80s, written by a guy named Jeff Perlman. Now, if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because Jeff Perlman was the author, is the author, I should say, 
of Sweetness, the the 2011 biography of our own beloved great greatest football player, not just greatest running back, the greatest player of all time, Sweetness himself, Walter Payton, and he wrote that uh, wrote that biography, and he is going to be on the show. I have uh, it, it's a great story or interesting story. I um, follow Jeff on on Twitter. And um, when I posted that uh, I got the book, I got the book on Friday, last Friday, and I posted how excited I was to have it. Can't wait to read it. And then I tagged Jeff on the uh, tweet and he liked and retweeted it. So when I went to his page to uh, see about following him, he had a pinned tweet at the top that said, if you email him proof of the um, that you bought the book, that he'd send you some swag. He'd send you a signed book plate, send me a, like a USFL sticker, maybe a postcard or something like that. So I said, figure what the hell. So I went over there and I, and I emailed him. And that's when one of uh, one of my listeners, uh, uh, Richard Brumlick, shout out to Richard for uh, bringing it to my attention that this is the Jeff Perlman that wrote the Sweetness book. And I figured, well, I'm going to email him anyway. So why not? So I emailed him uh, and asked him if he'd be interested in being on the show to talk about this USFL book. And, uh, you know, also, could he share some sweetness stories with us? And he agreed. I couldn't believe it, but I'm going to have a New York Times bestselling author on the show. And um, I'm going to have Jeff on the show to kind of fill a void, if you will, right where the week five review show uh, would be going uh, because, of course, the Bears have week five off, so I don't have a show to do uh, for that point. So that's when Jeff is going to be on the show. I'm going to be talking to him on, on Monday night, October the 8th, and the show will be out Tuesday, October the 9th. So they hear uh, the interview uh, between myself and Jeff Perlman talking about the USFL and uh, trying to dig some stories out of him about uh, Sweetness himself. Uh, you're definitely going to want to uh, tune in to... Uh, that one. I'm really looking forward uh, to this conversation. I just finished the book last night. It's awesome. Okay. The stories about this league, you know, are, are like too crazy not to be true. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it was in the eighties where everything was just crazy. I was only like, I was in, I was a young guy and I was only, you know, five, six years old during the, uh, the, the time that the league was present. But, uh, I mean, the stories are, are crazy. You got to read the book. Uh, it's the football for a buck, the crazy rise and crazier demise of the USFL written by Jeff Perlman. And, uh, he will be on the show Tuesday night or Tuesday, October the 9th to, uh, to talk about that. And, uh, we'll also get some Walter Payton stories, uh, out of him, uh, as well. So it's going into the spot where the week five review episode would be. And, uh, I'm looking forward to it very, very much. And I hope all of you guys, uh, tune in. Because uh, we're going to talk about sweetness and, and here's some bear stories uh, as well. So that should be a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to it very, very much. So I'm very excited uh, about that. And um, that's all we got uh, for news and notes. So we're going to go ahead and bring in our good friends, uh, Ren Dax, Brent Allen from the PewterCast podcast to talk about this game. And we cover a lot. Week four between the Bears and the Bucks. <laughs> Yeah, man. How you been? I've been good. I've been good. I've uh, been looking forward to this uh, conversation since week one. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, considering that uh, a lot's changed since uh, since we talked back in, uh, what, late May, early June. And, right. Um, since you, know, you guys talked. Well, you know, <laughs> that was your own doing there, Brent. Yeah, yeah, you guys took me for a ride on that episode, man. Oh, just a few, just a yeah. few. Yeah, but uh, but anyway, yeah. I mean, considering that um, the team that 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 uh, I think we were all expecting in 2017 decided to delay their arrival until this year, yeah. and yeah. then uh, the Bears coming out of nowhere and and trading for Khalil Mack, which took what was supposed to be a good defense to one that's uh, pretty uh, pretty damn. Uh, dominating yeah, and elite. Uh, at uh yeah uh that would be a good word for it and uh certainly making things uh interesting and distracting us from the fact that uh if only a little bit from the fact that our quarterback hasn't quite 
made his second year leap just yet. So it's <laughs> uh it's been interesting uh nonetheless. So but um welcome back to the show, guys. Um you know, Ren, when when we talked back in back in May, we were talking about the likely conversation that uh we could be heading into this game with a combined one victory between the two of us <laughs> right? because you were starting on the road at new Orleans. Then you host the world champions and then Monday night football against the, the Steelers, the likelihood of an Owen three start wasn't bad considering the team that you guys had in 2017. And then the bears having to start with green Bay. Then we got Arizona and um, who do we play? We two Seattle on Monday night mm-hmm. football. It wasn't the most outlandish idea that we could be talking about a team or a game that only had combined one wins instead uh, combined were four and two. And uh, I don't think anyone saw a week four matchup between two, two and one teams going into this thing. I wouldn't have bet on it. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of crazy. Cause like I said, a minute ago, it was, uh, this is the team that, that we were expecting last year, of course, with Jameis at the helm instead of uh, Mr. Fitzmagic himself and um, mm-hmm. how many times is this guy going to revive his career <laughs> you know he first he does it he comes out of nowhere to be the savior when mark bulger falls apart and with the rams he mm-hmm. somehow tricks the buffalo bills into giving him 59 million and he's been bouncing all over the league and, and every now and then he has that one great year and then mm-hmm. he kind of goes back into obscurity as a backup and has to take a job he's a journeyman kind of guy and now all of a sudden I mean, is there a, a, a dilemma? Is there a quarterback controversy in Tampa Bay right now, or is he still the man? I know that that, that Cutter is, is kind of playing it close to the vest right now. The only three people that know are Jameis, Fitzpatrick, and, and Cutter at the moment. So what do you guys think? There is a controversy, but only because people are talking about it. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, there's not a controversy in my mind. Look, the 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 starting quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers going forward is Jameis Winston. Now, will he suit up to start under center in Chicago? Maybe. Maybe not. Are they going to ride with Fitzpatrick for the hot hand until he goes cold? Maybe. Probably not. You could argue he's already gone cold after one game. I probably wouldn't. Um, you know, but it's it there there's not really a controversy. This is Jameis's team. Fitzpatrick himself has said, look, I'm just here as a caretaker. I'm keeping the seat warm while Jameis is gone. And, you know, Jameis has said, Hey, he's good with whatever happens when he comes back. They just want to win. So, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, Jameis is coming back under center. Uh, whether it's in this game or, you know, we go into our bye week after this game. And so come out a- against Atlanta in week uh, I guess it'd be week six of the season, week uh, game five for us. Um, you know, but I, I don't think there's really much of a controversy as much as just the who's going to start with this particular game kind of a question. Ren, where do you sit on this one? Well, there's a, it's a couple of things. Uh, one, it's not really a traditional QB controversy because it, he started the year out. Like, we haven't seen what Jameis can do with this offense. Like, you've talked about how – this is the team we expected last year, and we had the the year of growth with O.J. Howard and the year of growth with Chris Godwin, which we thought we were going to see last year. Uh, but now they're they're uh, playing for expectations. You know, we thought they would, and and with all these toys, uh, we saw this in preseason. Like Fitzpatrick looked great, Jameis looked even better. Even the third round, even the the mm-hmm. third quarterback Ryan Griffin, who's been in the system for three years, he looked awesome in preseason. Uh, so. You could see this coming. As a Buck fan, you just hope it would just, you know, translate to the regular season, and so far it has. When you have, a, like, a normal QB controversy, either the starter gets benched because they're playing bad or they get hurt, and the backup comes in and lights it up, and then you can see, you know, when the starter heals up, say, hey, we're just going to ride this, and, you know, you're going to get the job back, uh, you know, you know, sort of when he gets cold. Uh, but with Jameis... Like, like you, like I've said, we haven't seen him with this offense yet. Mm-hmm. It's not out of the realm to think that Jameis could be putting up similar type numbers. And I'm not going to go as far as say he's going to throw for 400 yards in three consecutive games because it's never been done before until Fitzpatrick just did it the first three weeks of the season. But 
to have put the, the offense to put up these points, be able to go up and down the field and, uh, you know, throw the ball over the, over the top of defenses and do these big chunk plays that, you know, like third, like I would say third and 18, but like, like second and 18 doesn't scare this team. Like I remember mm-hmm. I've been a Bucks fan since birth and every offense we, we ever had, and I'm, I'm including Gruden, uh, you know, a, a, even like 10 win teams. If it was first and 20, the drive was over. It just was. It was now. It's it's no problem. Like, if you go back and look at our drives this year, we rarely when we when we score, we rarely have a third down. Like mm-hmm. it's 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 very rare that that happens. It's like you know it comes like second and six or second and four, and the next thing you know they throw the ball downfield for like fifteen yards, and and Mike Evans or Deshaun Watson or Deshaun Watson. <laughs> uh, uh, D Jax, uh, Deshaun Jackson, or Chris Godwin, or OJ Howard, or Cambrate. Somebody pulls it down like 15 yards downfield, and we're off and rolling again. So, sort of put a button on this. It's not a traditional QB controversy. Uh, do I think there is one? No. I've been preaching that Jameis should come back for the Chicago game because he's done nothing but watch film on Chicago for four weeks now. Uh, he's been practicing on doing two days. Uh, during the week, four times a week, he's had ex NFL receivers and, and and local college graduates out there with him. They've even been doing eleven on eleven uh, uh, games out there at at a, at a local center. So you know, Jameis has not been sitting on his hands. And uh, I always thought that if you know, it's it's almost it's almost too good to be true of a setup for Jameis because, like I said, he comes back and he has four weeks. He has all these new weapons. But it sounds like in the building that it might be a you're going to have to sit a week because I know the NFL punished you. But now this is our punishment from us to you is that you're going to have to sit one more week. And they have that built in excuse. It's a quote unquote short week. So. So, I mean, are you guys in the majority or the minority on this with with thinking or saying not thinking, but saying that. uh you know, it's Winston's team. It's Winston's job. He should come in and and be the starter again. I mean, is the the fan base split on this kind of thing? Considering the the, the start that Fitzpatrick has had, or are they are they Team Jameis? Have they had it with him and, and is you know getting suspended for something so stupid? Or you know, what's the situation there? No, it's it's very much Team Jameis, and a couple of reasons. One, mm-hmm. he went to Florida State. Florida State's in the state of Florida. You know, though those if. If you've ever if you ever want to get beat up on Twitter, uh, tweet at Florida State football and say something negative. Those guys will just <laughs> they, they, they will tear you to pieces. They're they're at, they're the worst. They're like they're like Patriot fans and Yankee fans rolled into one. Hmm. Um, but. There's a couple of things that go in this, too, as well, like you said before, Fitzpatrick, he does this. You know, there's an expiration date on this Fitz magic. Right. And the Buccaneers have to sort of find out what they really have in Jameis Winston. You know, I would argue he's made, he's he's grown every year as a quarterback. He has a mistake. He figures it out and he fixed it. This year it's going to be fumbling in the pocket. Last mm-hmm. year was policing com- completion percentage and interceptions. He took care of that last year. Uh, but they picked up his fifth year option. It's $20 million. You got to make a decision on this guy and you can't sit him for the year behind a guy who you know in your heart of hearts is eventually going to turn back into a pumpkin. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you know, listen, there are people who never like the Jameis pick. They don't like Jameis, and no matter what, they're just going to not like Jameis. And those are people who are Buccaneer fans. Um, So, you know, those guys are always going to say that that they don't want Jameis. But, I mean, Ren's right. You know, Fitzmagic has an expiration date, and you know, the only question is if we've seen it now. And I'll tell you, um, uh, I, I think we are certainly in the majority, but there is that that's, that caveat of people, you know, that, that slew of people who just no matter what happens, um, you know, they're going to be anti Jameis. And, you know, I don't know if other, if other fan bases deal with that, you know, that there's just a group of people who are going to hate this particular player no matter what they do. Um but uh, that's something we see. But, you know, the other thing, too, is you talk about the, the quarterback controversy, something else that makes this different. Fitzpatrick isn't coming in trying to take a starting job. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, he, I mean, it, you know, you see this, I guess, maybe with a lot of other ones, you know, the backup quarterback secretly really wants to get that 
or maybe not even secretly, they really want the starting job. You know, they hope that they can come in, outplay the the starter, they can do something, or they can go somewhere else, or they can do whatever and become the starting job. That's not the case with Fitzpatrick. They had to talk him out of retiring, you know. Uh, mm. And I I know they had to talk him out of retiring to get him there as a backup last year. I'm not entirely sure if that's exactly what happened in this particular offseason as well. But, I mean, when they when they brought him back in, they knew that the, the – uh, suspension was coming. They knew that it was likely. I don't think they knew exactly how many games it were it was yet. But they brought Fitzpatrick here to get us through this suspension. And now that the suspension is over, you know, no one expected Fitzpatrick to to have the the last three games that he's had. Even even the loss to the Steelers notwithstanding. He he still had three quarters of pretty good quarterback play in his yeah. last game. So you know, it, it it's it's I I don't I don't know, Ren, if if I'm with you or if I interpret what I, what we're seeing the same way as the sitting one more game is also punishment, like from the organization. Um, I suppose it could be. I I just yeah I don't know. Well, I think we'll see. We'll have to see about that. So coming into this in this into this game, it really does appear to kind of be a uh, strength against strength uh, matchup when your offense and our defense take the field uh Mm -hmm. on sunday and and my main question is i mean i only got to catch the the last few exciting minutes of the game where the bucks made a run at it because i was Mm -hmm. i was recording my 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 review episode during the monday night game um so i didn't get to see all of the the horror of the three interceptions in the first (gasps) half and everything i just got to see fitz magic almost win that game against uh uh, pittsburgh Mm -hmm. on 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 monday night um, and they were throwing the book at 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 you guys with the pass rush and everything. How mm-hmm. how has the pass rush been? I mean, I know you guys have uh, you've been eaten on the pass and 400 yards in, in three games uh, and everything. How has the pass pro been uh, for Fitzpatrick in these first three games? Well, I mean, Fitzpatrick has thrown 400 yards in each of the games. Yeah, you can't get 400 yards unless your pass protection is is up to snuff. And I got to tell you, uh, you know. People want to talk about Ryan Fitzpatrick. Ren alluded to this earlier, and I'm 100 percent in agreement with him on this. I don't care who would have been under center in these last few games with the what with what the offensive line was doing and how they were protecting the quarterback, with the chemistry that we've had with all of our receivers and all of these weapons, um, with what we saw with Jameis out of the preseason and what we saw with Fitzpatrick out of the preseason. I have no doubt that had it been Jameis, the results would have been very very similar. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say that the two are plug and play right now because I don't think that that's necessarily the case. It kind of seems like that's the case. So, yeah, pass protection is great. Something that happened this past uh, particular week, the day of the game, our brand new fancy shiny center, who has certainly, I think, been the case for revitalizing this offensive line, uh, got added to the injury report with an illness. So he was playing sick. Um, you know, I don't want to say that that's an excuse. But, you know, it certainly is a factor, I, I think, in a lot of that, uh, a lot of that. So the pass protection has been really good. Um, I wouldn't say that our offensive line is road graders yet for the run game. Our run game really has yet to get going. Um, I, I don't want it, It's not a concern. It's just been a non-factor for the mm-hmm. most part. Uh, so it's really the it's really that passing game. And, um, you know, the, the guys are out there lighting it up, whether it's going to be Fitzpatrick or Jameis, um, you know, I it's going to be hard to beat uh, if that offensive line is, you know, protecting them the way that they need to be. Yeah, there's a lot of factors that, sorry, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Like, it was the first time saw a 3-4 defense with the new center. Like Brent said, sure. he wasn't feeling well. They protected much better in the second half than they did in the first half. And just a little caveat to the, I know you didn't see it, uh, but it wasn't three interceptions in the first half. It was three interceptions on four throws and one throw didn't count because they're roughing the passer so by Mm. the book he threw three interceptions on three consecutive passes in the second quarter and we had a fumble in the second quarter as well that we lost so that's where that the steelers that the steelers capitalized on all four of those if you go back and actually look at the box score the buccaneers outscored the steelers in the first quarter the third quarter and the fourth quarter hmm and and we completely shut them out in the second half, outscore them. It was the the Steelers capitalizing on four very very costly mistakes right there, back to back to back to back. Is that four back to backs? Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, and one, you know, and one was a pick six. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's it's uh, 
this game for the Buccaneers wasn't as bad as it felt like at the time. And, and Ren and I are going to go into that certainly on our show this week as well. So, so what, when I, when I was asking about the pass protection, it, it, it was more about, you know, has Fitzpatrick been three step boom and it's out. So the pass, you know, so the pass rush doesn't have time to get there or has he been sitting back in the pocket? Therefore your pass protection has been doing its job. Has it been a mixture? Because, I've only seen highlights and, you know, game breaks and things like that when I see, like, especially against the the Saints in the first game. And, you know, three-step drop, boom, there's uh, Jackson down the center of the field for, for a touchdown uh, and whatnot. And then again on the first play of the game against Philadelphia the week after that. And, you know, I watched him do it again in those last few minutes against the uh, the Steelers. It seemed like the ball was coming out quicker as opposed to, you know, the pass protection actually being or having a chance to do its job, I should say. Okay, yeah, sorry. We just get excited when we get to, you know, talk <laughs> to other fans about our team. <laughs> hey, Chicago fans, here, l- listen to us. Look how smart we are about our team. Um, the first two games of pass protection was outstanding. Like, right. As fans, as beat reporters, which we're not, but, you know, every pundit in the local area pretty much was saying verbatim that, the reason Fitzpatrick can throw for this and has nine touchdowns in the first two games is because of the pass protection. Yes, sometimes he's getting the ball out quick, but there was many, many times where I, I, it's harder to think of a time that he was being pressured in the first two games than he wasn't. Like I can't, I know he was sacked, but I can't remember it. The Steelers mm-hmm. game, the exact opposite. You know, I wasn't even sure he was going to make it out of the first half alive. Huh. And I'll tell you what, going back to, you know, sort of the bounce off the, the quarterback controversy thing. If if I think what is going to happen, which is Jameis isn't going to start in Chicago, and Fitzpatrick has a, a half like he did against Pittsburgh, Jameis comes out and starts the second half. Sure. Like if sure. Jameis was active for that Steelers game, he would have started the second half and uh, it would have been the perfect scenario for the Bucks as far as optics. So it doesn't matter what Jameis did because we turned the ball over four times in the second quarter. And if, and if he wins, he's a savior. If he plays a bad game, he's knocking off Russ, but he wasn't bad as Patrick. So, you know, it, it's it, we were really close, and we've used the phrase a couple times because we like it. We were really close for, for Fitzmagic to have that expiration date that game. Mm-hmm. So what's changed from, from last year to this year? Because you basically have the same – cast of characters but only you know this year you guys are actually pulling it off whereas the last year it was anything but yeah well i I think there's a couple things uh there are a few key uh changes in the cast of characters uh some of them are cancers from the locker room last year that are gone uh i.e chris baker who is one of them uh but also the influx of a guy like ryan jensen in the new center which i referenced him uh just a little bit earlier um the 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 attitude and what he seems to have brought to this team uh it has been really phenomenal also moving uh ali marpet who we had at center last year sort of as an experiment um and i think we would have left him at center again had we not gotten a ryan jensen but uh, we were able to actually move him back into a guard he'll be a pro bowl guard i think in this league i absolutely do um so it, you know reforming that offensive line I think has been a big deal. Uh, another one, and I, I, you know, we can't undersell it. And Ren and I are, have, Ren and I were never on the fire Dirk Cutter train last year, mm. um, but seeing Dirk Cutter give up the play calling and allow the the offensive coordinator to call the plays, and that doesn't mean that he just kind of threw the book at him and said, okay, here you call the plays, and and now Todd Munkin is calling the plays in a vacuum. Dirk Cutter's still on headset with him. He's still involved in that process, but Cutter now has the ability to to broaden the game a little bit more and to look at other things plus Todd Munkin's bringing in some new plays that honestly Cutter wouldn't have called Uh, we saw things like a quarterback sneak which we've never seen really (laughs) Dirk Cutter call ever 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 (laughs) never never ran one going for a fourth down half foot right Um, won't run it so so there are those things but the the other thing really is execution 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 they're calling a lot of the same plays that they did last year as you mentioned there's a lot of the same people who were here last year it's just the players were not executing they weren't getting it done and this year they're getting it done they're executing call it they've just been together for another year you can call whatever you want but at the end of the day the players are actually executing what the coaches are calling do you think all... go ahead Ren. and i'd also like to point to the defensive side of the ball 
bring in a guys like JPP, Vinnie Curry, Bo Allen. The last two I said were both, you know, on the Eagles Super Bowl winning team. We got a guy from the Bears, a Mitch Unrein, a mm-hmm. grit glue guy yeah. uh, that's had a concussion and hasn't been able to show up for us. Our first round draft pick, Via Vea, he hasn't seen the field yet uh, in there. But uh, if you look at the scores, you can see how, like, you look at the Saints game and it was 48 to 40. You're like, oh, the defense played terrible. We were up 48 to 24 and we started going to this prevent defense and offense and allowed the Saints back in the game. Uh, you look at the Philly game and. <clears throat> The same thing happened in the fourth quarter where the defense starts to go in the shell, uh, keep everything in front of them, make them drive down the field and score, which they did. But once again, the Buccaneers were up two scores late in the game. And then this Pittsburgh game, they shut them out in the second half and you turn the ball over four times in one quarter and one was a pick six. So you look at 30 points, well, seven of those aren't on the defense at all. So now you have it down to 23 and then you put them in bad field position, you know, three times in a row uh the defense is playing better than they were last year they're Mm -hmm. they're not the bears now don't get me wrong so (laughs) bears fans don't be like hey what the hell is he talking about i get that we're not a bear we're not a top five defense but what we were last year to this year that attitude and and with all the new players on the defensive line i think is starting to gel uh we got a lot of rookies in the secondary i know you probably were not upset that chris conti got moved to ir actually i was very upset i was uh (laughs) oh that's right i i I, I don't know if you saw my tweet the other day when uh when they announced he was going on ir i was like damn now he won't be in the secondary making fatal errors against the bears uh, on Sunday, or Trey Burton doesn't get the shot put him into the ground, you know, on en route to a 75 yard touchdown uh, run or anything like that. I was very upset that Chris Conti won't be playing on Sunday. That's true. I, I didn't think that through. But, uh, <laughs> it, but, uh, you will have a shot at three rookies that none of them have. Only I think one has a full. Couple of them only have a full game under their belt. Our slot, our quarter, our uh, cornerback. Um, opposite Brent Grimes and now the safety who's taking Conti's place and the other safety is only a second year you know he's mm-hmm. only played like 19 this will be like his 20th game so a very young secondary uh coming in there but we're faster we're younger we're more athletic and I really feel like the defense is trending in the right direction where last year I I would I wouldn't have trusted him with with anything like any like if they had to do something to win the game unless it was let the team drive down and score in under 30 seconds I wouldn't I I said they they probably can't do it. Do do you think that that 2017 was was um, maybe a year where they just kind of felt the pressure of the expectations? You know, because 2016 they kind of came out of nowhere to to take that nine and seven, almost made the playoffs. Then they add Deshaun Jackson and and OJ Howard in the draft, and and things are really looking up uh, with the Bucks. And then it just it just didn't happen. You know, you 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 miss your first game of the year. You have to play 16 straight after a week one by you you take an easy win over my lousy bears last year and then it's like the further we got away from that victory or that loss to tampa bay the worse it looked because the buccaneers just weren't a good football team last Mm -hmm. year do you think that had something to do with with how it was i mean you had bad chemistry with you said the cancers like chris baker and and some of those guys and then just overall like not living up to the expectations that people had. I mean, a lot of people, including all three guys in this conversation, had the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as a playoff team last year. Yeah, it it's hard to put a finger on it. Um, yeah. Once again, for like the fourth time, and say there's a few things here. Uh, <laughs> the easiest ex- explanation is Brent talked about him earlier. Todd Munkin, who has started out two years as a wide receiver coach. Then he became the full-time offensive coordinator, uh, and now he, he's calling the plays. So now the press gets to talk to him because before Dirk Cutter was the offensive coordinator and the head coach, so there was no there was no offensive weekly offensive coordinator press conference really. Sure. And he came out at the beginning of, of of training camp and said, "We chose to suck." He's like, "That's mm-hmm. it, plain and simple. Like we chose to stink on offense, defense." And here's what I think it is. I think that it was a huge growing experience for Dirk Cutter as a head coach. You know, not everybody walks into this and has the uh, success of a Sean McVay. Um, You know, there's a learning process, and I thought Dirk Cutter learned a lot about how to be a head coach of a football team. And, you know, the 
I don't want to call them excuses, but the reasons I, I'll call them excuses. I weren't saying you were saying they're excuses, but the hurricane and, and hard knocks and believing, thinking we were better. We thought the defensive line who had was 11th in sacks the year before kept the same guys brought in Chris Baker, who was a very good defensive tackle sacker. You guys you know, were excited and, about him last year. Yeah. yeah. Everybody was. Yeah. yeah. He just, he just did a money grab and, and you'll, you know, you'll see it. You saw it this year because we cut him. Uh, and he didn't get the rest of his money, and then he went to Cincinnati, and before his basically season guaranteed money cut it came in, they cut him. Um, and and the 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 uh, I guess the 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 maxim around Chris Baker was good player doesn't like to practice. Well, it got to when you know when you're not when you don't become a good player anymore, and you don't like to practice, it's kind of like we'll put up with you until we can replace you. Yeah, and that has come quick for him. You know, the uh, the NFL has retired Chris Baker in about six months. So you know, we thought we had the horses. The defense was coming off a really nice second half in 2016, and you know, you can throw any moniker you want on it, but I'm going to go back to Todd Munkin. Was they chose to suck? Okay, so how about that defense and? You know, we, we, we trim we trim Chris Baker off that roster, but you add a Vinnie Curry, you trade for, for uh Pierre Paul, Jason Pierre Paul and all seven of his fingers. And um you know, you, you, you draft Vita Vea, which I don't think many people saw coming. I, I I don't think um I don't think anybody saw you guys taking a defensive tackle uh in the first round. I I can't remember what the mock drafts were saying, but Vita Vea was not on the list, so you know, I mean, I know that he hasn't played for you guys yet, but it was a surprise pick, and mm-hmm. you guys made some additions, like you said, Bo Allen and Vinnie Curry and uh, JPP. And um, you know, w- what about the back end, the the back seven? I I know all the guys up front. What about the guys on the back mm-hmm. side? Well, I, I mean, you mentioned that, and and just a slight correction, and you, there's no way you or your guys would know this. There is one media outlet that was reporting and was on the Vita Vea train almost the entire time there's an organization down here called the pewter report um though uh you know they just said watch out these guys like these guys i'll say this just to back up in the off season jason light kind of put out a little video where basically what he said is he said hey this wasn't a good year and we know what's wrong and we know what we have to do to fix it and he didn't elaborate on that and we're all like okay well exactly what are you talking about and they went in and uh they started at the front. They started in the trenches and, you know, they brought in all those guys that you talked about and then they drafted Vita Vea and, um, you know, none of Ren, what there's two guys on our defensive line, three guys, I think from our defensive line last year, that's left this year. Um, and, and basically yeah. what he did Total was he overall. got us two starting caliber, uh, defensive lines and essentially injury proved our defensive line and thank god he did because we've got three major defensive linemen who have been out with injury haven't really seen the field and mitch on ryan vita vea and somebody else has gone to i don't remember who um oh bo allen bo allen's been injured uh the last the last uh, game and and going into this week so um you know the that has been an issue the only real coaching change that they made except for moving todd munkin from wide receivers coach to full-time offensive coordinator is they fired the the defensive line coach and brought in Brinson Buckner from Arizona, uh, which certainly that was a huge, huge thing through the off season watching coach Buckner coach. um, You could just see whenever he got out there during training camp, all the media and everybody with cameras just sort of flooded to him just to watch him coach. Uh, So, you know, essentially, like I said, they injury proofed that defensive line. And, uh, you know, defensive line is doing better. JPP already has more sacks in three games than our leading uh, defensive end in all of last year. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, good on them. The The linebacking course stayed pretty much exactly the same. Um, as we have one guy who's out with an injury right now, but his backup uh, is very, very good in Adarius Taylor. The only change really there is he changed his last name in the offseason, and we all have trouble saying his name. Uh, but the the big thing is you mentioned that back you know those back guys that that whole backfield there on the defensive side. Uh, we brought back Brent Grimes who we thought he was going to retire last year. They got him back. We had VH3. VH3 looked great throughout preseason uh, and and through the first little bit until he got injured. Now he's out on IR. And uh, you know we went in and we drafted two cornerbacks 
and we drafted a, another safety. And as Ren mentioned earlier, we had a we have a sophomore safety who's doing very well, by the way. Justin Evans is doing great, but he's still a sophomore. You know, it's he's. Sure. I, I think technically he's now a veteran, but I wouldn't call him a veteran yet personally. So, you know, we got Carlton Davis. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit, a little bit, you know, lengthier on his arms, but he's still a rookie. We got MJ Stewart. Who's looking great. He's still a rookie, you know, filling in in the slot and we play a lot of slot. So, um, uh, a lot of nickel and, uh, you know, so the defense, you know, as Vren said, I think the defense is better than they have looked over the last little bit, but they're still, you know, they're still kind of coming together. So uh, Mike Smith, how is he doing this year? Cause that was another thing that we talked about last year. Everybody was so excited yeah. that we're going to have a coordinator down, you know, nailed down for the next couple of seasons instead of this revolving door that you had in the defensive coordinator mm-hmm. spot. And then last year went about as badly as it could on the defensive side uh, and everything. But, but Mike Smith still came back this year. And regardless of how the points have been stacking up in these first three games, overall, how do you think Mike Smith has been doing thus far? <laughs> That's about um, as well articulated as I think we can be right there. All right. Okay. You know, no, I mean, you were right. Like, we were really excited about having Mike Smith, you know, nailed down for two years. Um, we were afraid he wasn't going to, you know, he's a two time NFL coach of the year. He's forgotten more football than I'll ever know. All of us all together, all our football knowledge, of course, but you could really right. say about any NFL, any NFL coach. I, it's, it's hard because you don't know what he's calling and what he's asking these guys to do. And we really don't know, especially on the backside, we don't know what they can do and, and what they're not good at yet. Um, People have been, you know, and when I say people, I'm always talking about Twitter. Like, that's where I get all my news for everything nowadays <laughs> and have for like three years. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Like, I don't watch the news. I don't go on Facebook. Twitter's it for me. If it doesn't cross my timeline, I don't know it exists. Right. Uh, so a lot of people have been yelling at Mike Smith. But like I said, the, the numbers are a bit skewed because the way the games have gone, I think the defensive line is much improved. And he's doing what he can with it. The linebacking core is, like Brent said, it's the same and it's solid. And we got a lot of rookies in the back. And they've made plays, but they've also looked like rookies. And there's a, a guy out uh, out here who's been doing podcasts for like 12 years. He's like the godfather of Buccaneer podcasts. Like he was doing podcasts where there was a smartphone. And we actually just recorded a segment for him for our next episode coming up. And something that he likes to say, he's like, I don't give a shit how many yards you give up. Like – just it's all at the end of the day look it's scoreboard you know right we'd all like to have the defense that you know only gives up 16 and a half points a game and and in today's nfl it's just not really realistic you know every new rule that comes out is skewed towards the offense being able to score points now they're you know you can't hit a receiver in a certain area we all know about the quarterback and, and roughing the passer and if you watch it monday night i think four were called uh you know two on each team and and three of them i thought were ridiculous uh so people are down on mike smith um but i think it's it, like i said i think it's going to be fine i think he now he has the horses to be able to pull off his defense uh, but there's going to be some lunts because because of the rookies. What I expect to see from the Buccaneers is Justin Evans, who's the sophomore back there. He's super athletic. He's going to play a lot of single high safety. Uh, Jordan Whitehead, who's the rookie, who'll be filling it for Conti, is going to come down in the box and basically play a hybrid linebacker position because he can bring the wood. And he's a rookie. He doesn't understand. He can knock himself out yet. So right. you know he, his body bounces back. Recovery day. It doesn't exist for him. He's 23. Like you know he's he's fine. Uh, and Carlton Davis, I think, is, is, is a very good rookie cover, cover corner. He's not a shutdown corner, but as rookie corners go, I, I think he's, he's well above average. And then it's all going to depend on Brent Grimes. I expect the Bucks to put eight in the box, stuff Howard, bottle up Cohen, and, and tell Trubisky to beat us. And I, I'm pretty sure that's what everyone's done against you so far. So far. I mean, that's, that's what actually Arizona did a fantastic job of. On Sunday, he carried the ball 24 times, which is usually the key to victory because we are 9-2 and two when Jordan Howard carries the ball 20 times or more. But he did it for a grand total of 61 yards uh, uh-huh. on, on Sunday. The only thing that, that makes you feel okay about that 
is that they held Todd Gurley to even less than uh, Jordan Howard. Uh, on, David Johnson. Well, no, no, no. The, the, the Cardinals, when they played the Rams the week before, oh, they okay, held I'm Todd sorry. Gurley to like 34 yards or something like that on, on an insane amount of carries. And even though the, the Rams put up 34 on them, uh, Todd Gurley wasn't a factor in that, uh, in that decision. I mean, it's, it's they're, they're very good run defense. But, um, yeah, I mean, especially with the way that Trubisky has played uh, the first three weeks, it's been very disappointing uh, watching him not make the leap we've been waiting all season to watch him make. And, um, you know, the well, difference is we, under, we understand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we understand so, the, the, the second year quarterback not making the leap you, you want <laughs> to see. So but it's just like, you know, the, the only difference between this year and last year is like that was pretty much last year's game plan. You load the box, you stop Howard, you stuff the run, dare Trubisky to throw the football. It's like, well, we actually have horses this year for him to throw the football to. Last year they were daring us to throw the ball because we had no one. No one was afraid of the pass because there was nobody out there to catch it. This year we have guys to catch it, which is what makes watching this offense so disappointing or so frustrating at times is that we went out and we spent $40 million on Allen Robinson and another 30 on Trey Burton, another 26 on um, Gabriel. We gave up next year's second round pick to go get Anthony Miller in the second round as well. And, you know, we don't have much to show for it on the offensive side of the ball. We've scored, I think, four touchdowns in three games on the offensive side. The defense has scored a touchdown and in, 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 has scored two touchdowns so far. They had four straight turnovers in the fourth, in the second half against the Cardinals, and we didn't have much to show uh, for it. So, I mean, the offense has been extremely frustrating uh, to watch. So the game plan would be a solid one. It's just that now it's, it's a bit more risky because we actually do have guys out there who can make something happen. It's just up to Trubisky to get them the ball. Is that sort of uh, – I'm, I'm flipping the script here to ask you a question. Sorry. Uh, you know, outside looking in, I'm not a Bears fan. I don't follow the Bears. And what I've seen is when I've seen them on TV, and that was, of course, you know uh, – Sunday night. Was that Monday Night Football? Well, we yeah. played two national TV games to start that, the year off, so. Okay. What's the deal with Trubisky not seeing the middle of the field? Is that a thing, or is that just blown out of proportion? Uh, well, I mean, that freeze frame thing obviously was very misleading. Um, the one where – we look like we're, th- we're, we're we went for a screen and Trey Burton's wide open in the middle of the field on that one right. still frame uh, and everything. What it doesn't show you is that half a second later, haha, Clinton Dix would have picked off the ball if Trubisky had thrown it to him. Um, so in the end, he made the right decision um, as far as not throwing it to Trey Burton. I mean, I personally would have loved to see him try as opposed to what actually happened. On third and three from the five, we lose five yards you know, because the screenplay went absolutely nowhere to the left. So I also uh, started a petition on Twitter to outlaw bubble screens uh, for the Chicago Bears because <laughs> in, in all my fandom, I've never seen it work. Not since the days of John Shoup in 1994 when it was Steve Walsh throwing bubble screens to Jeff Graham and Curtis Conway has that play worked. So I would just very much like for Nagy to take that page out of the playbook and throw it out. So... Um, You know, I I don't know what it is, to be honest with you. I mean, the thing that's been frustrating with Trubisky is that it's it's if he's not trying to force it into someone who's not open, he's missing guys who are wide open. Like twice in the last two weeks, Taylor Gabriel has been wide open down the seam and he's thrown it over his head. Now, granted, Taylor Gabriel is not the tallest receiver in the league, but he hasn't even made it close. I mean, he launched it over his head on both occasions and both times. Gabriel could have walked into the end zone standing up. I mean, you know, it's, it's throws like that that make it frustrating to watch. And then on the very next play, he'll roll out to his left and try to force it into three defenders, and the ball would have to go through all three guys to get to our guy who's standing behind them all. So it, it makes you wonder, you know, what he does see and, and, and why he makes the decisions that he does. Gotcha. So, you so got, I have a question. I have a question. Go ahead, Larry, then. Uh, you know, the Buccaneers, um, we have been uh, – our offense has really hung its hat on the air game. You know, the, the big threats, the deep threats. Um, my, we've, had, we've had at least one receiver go for 125-plus yards in all three games. In one game, we had two of them do that, yeah. which is nearly unheard of. Um, how do you guys feel about that, knowing that, that you know, 
you've Fitz got magic's that. Magic's coming to town, baby. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why I asked earlier <laughs> With all about the weapons the, from Winston. Uh, yeah, the, when when I when I asked earlier about the pass protection, that's what I was wondering. Was it was it more of a, a scheme thing where Fitzpatrick was getting the ball out of his hands, or was he? Ba- did he have time to sit in the pocket and find those guys open? Because our pass rush has been nothing if not effective up to this right. point. And the the thing about having Khalil Mack on the team was that he's playing with a bunch of guys he did not have a chance to play with in Oakland. You know, he didn't have Akeem Hicks or Eddie Goldman up front. He didn't have Leonard Floyd on the other side. He didn't have Roquan Smith and Danny Trevathan behind him. And an, an emerging secondary in Kyle Fuller and Amukamura with Eddie Jackson and Adrian Amos and, and at, the, at the safety position. He doesn't have to do it all on his own like he did in Oakland. And then the effect that you're seeing is that it's making everyone around him play that much better. Because we had six sacks against Russell Wilson and the Seahawks. Mac was only responsible for one of them. You know, right. it's not like he came in and he had five sacks and then we were lucky enough somebody else scooped up one. It didn't take over the game like Lawrence Taylor or anything like that as far as the sacks were concerned. Mac is spreading it or, or making it possible to spread it around and making everybody dangerous. I, you know, if as long as we can get to Fitzpatrick or Jameis, whoever it ends up being, uh, I think we'll be okay. But the fact that you guys have been lighting it up in the past and you've got, you know, seeing those big plays gives me flashbacks of the Sunday night game because that's what beat us against Green Bay was the big play. It wasn't Aaron Rodgers had three long 15-play drives that wore us down and each one of them ended with a one-yard run from the goal line or anything like that. It was a 75-yard pass to uh, Devontae a- or Cobb. It was Cobb. Yeah, it was Cobb. Had a, a long pass play to Devontae Adams and a 40-yard pass to uh, – I can't even believe this that I'm saying this. Dude's name is Geronimo. That was his, that's his <laughs> first name. He right. caught a pass for 40 yards uh, on, on one play as well. So we were, we're, we're prone or at least weak to the, to the big play. Happened to us again against Arizona. Somebody decided not to cover their tight end, and he walked in like all by himself from about 35 yards out uh, or so. So that's what I'm worried about. If we can't get to the pass rusher, you know, we have breakdowns in coverage or somebody misses an assignment or something like that. And, you know, you can't imagine leaving Deshaun Jackson alone back there, but we've somehow managed to find a way to do that or to leave him all the space in the world to find 70 yards of wide open grass to run down. So it could be interesting. And that's why I was saying it's a strength against strength thing. Who's going to come out stronger uh, on Sunday is going to be the real the real question for me. So, I mean, the, that's the matchup everybody's going to be looking at. And, but I think we as Bear fans are going to be far more interested to see what our offense can do against your defense. Right. Uh, what I will say about our offensive line is that, you know, the Steelers game was an anomaly, especially the first half, compared to what we've seen, you know, three games is in a huge sample mm-hmm. size. Right. Uh, but, and, you know, coach, the head coach, Dirk Cutters, pressed her. He was quick to point out that, that, there was a lot of missed blown assignments that normally do not happen. Um, and it, it, by his tone and his body language, it, it kind of seemed like he wasn't worried about it. You know, like this is going to be a quick fix. Look, it was just, you know, and, you know, Pittsburgh runs a three, four and they're probably the best in the league at disguising blitzes, you know, and that's sort of how the three, four is up is, uh, is, is why it's such an effective defense against you know, against some offensive lines. But, um, out of let's see what 16 what was that 32 no no it can't be 32 what's wait 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 how many quarters eight eight times three is 24 there you go. 22 out of the 24 quarters that the bucks that can't be right it's not right it's 12 no. so far bro 12 yeah 12. four quarters okay there four we times go three. Eight, 12. <laughs> four times wow. three is 12 where, where was i i, I don't know thinking. man i, I don't That's know smart. I, yeah yeah math hard uh <laughs> <laughs> so 10 out of the 12 quarters i think the offensive i would say eight out of out of the 12 have been excellent uh-huh. and 10 out of the 12 have been good and two have been really bad, which were the first half of the Steelers game. Sure. Sure. So who you guys got kicking for you now? Cause I mean, talk about, I mean, all throughout hard knocks, all we talked about was Aguayo versus, uh, was it folk? Who was the other? Kicker? Oh, last year. Yeah. 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 And... yeah uh, we have a guy named Chandler Catanzaro. Um, you know, here, here's a Catanzaro a... a signing or another draft choice. No, he's a sign. He was a free agent pick, okay. I think, out of the 
was he from the Jets? Ran from not, the Jets. He was a kicker when the car when the Cardinals were good and went to the NFC Championship game. He was their kicker. Yeah. Okay. And then the next year he had a bad year, kind of like Aguayo had a bad year as rookie of the Bucks, and everyone blamed it on you know like, well, if you would have made that kick, we would won that game. If you would have made that kick, there was a couple of games where people felt it was his fault. They cut him. He went to the Jets and did really well. Uh, sort of resurrected his career and showed that that year was an anomaly. And we signed him for like three years for like nine million. He's getting like three point. He's getting like three yeah. million dollars a year. Yeah, wow. they, yeah, they're paying him for sure as a kicker. And you know, in case anybody's out there wondering, he's missed one kick in each of the first two games. But he went, you know, he put up a hundred percent against the Steelers. So, you know, we'll we'll see. Um, you know, in, in today's league, today's kicker today's kicks uh, you know nobody's 100 percent. people are going to miss in tampa especially after dealing with aguayo and then after dealing with folk and all of that anytime somebody misses i think uh you know the fans it's in such tampa, a, it's it, such a it, huge it, deal yeah, yeah it becomes such a huge deal um but uh it, you know it's it's he'll be a middle of the road guy you know if he goes 75 80 percent that's you know it, it'll be normal yeah, because we, we had – and I, I know what you mean by saying if there's a missed kick, all of a sudden you start getting PTSD on on, uh, you know, on missing kicks and everything. We had very, something very similar. The guy that we replaced Robbie Gold with, who, of course, is now the best kicker in the NFL in San Francisco. He hasn't missed a kick in 40 years now since he left the Bears. But um, the guy – You feel that, that way about Matt Bryant. Right. So, I mean, we re, you know the guy that we replaced him with, whose name is eluding me at the – Connor Barth – um, you another know, Buccaneer. yeah, but another guy that that couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't quite remember the rule is between the uprights, <laughs> not outside them. Oh, uh, you, know, you know, right? It's that's oh, yeah. unbelievable. I mean, that kid in, in uh, Cleveland learned that lesson the hard way. Yeah. But, um, you know, but it's like uh, Cody Park, he comes in. We give him, I think, two plus million dollars a season to come and kick for us. And he was perfect through the preseason. Perfect in the first two games and then missed a field goal on Sunday against Arizona. And this was in the midst of them taking that early 14 to nothing lead on us. And it just kind of felt snake bit that this game wasn't going to go your way because not only are we, as our defense, allowing 14 points against the team that scored six in the first two games, but now our kicker, who's been pretty good, is shanking kicks. And so we're screwed. Uh, for this one is this one's just not going to happen so I get where you guys are feeling that every missed kick is a is a big deal or at least everybody remembers that you miss a kick uh, because mm. of what has been going on with the kicking game with you guys yeah everybody's butt still puckers whenever the kicker you know puts toe to leather out there you know yeah. it's gonna happen yeah, yeah the so, days I mean, of the days of after scoring a touchdown like getting up and and going to get a drink of water or whatever you have to do and skipping the extra point are over for a couple of years for Buck fans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're watching. Yeah, You're I totally watching. Get that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's going to be a, a far more interesting game than the one that we were, ex- that we were, you know, prefacing when we talked back in the, in the summer. Ren, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like we said yeah. at the start of the conversation, we, we could be talking about two teams combined for one win uh, coming into this thing. And, um, you know, now it's a far more interesting. You got the, your electrifying offense. We got our crazy defense in this thing. They're going to go head to head on Sunday. You know, playing for the lead in our divisions. Yeah, well, I mean, we we have it right now. We have ours, um, but it's we, uh, we have know, ours. We're we're playing to keep it, and I'm sure you guys are as well. I mean, you guys, it's a three way mm-hmm. tie uh, right now. But you're you're in front. Um, mm-hmm. But we were know. there first. <laughs> and we have the division win too so. ah, that, well yeah we have a division loss so we're just yeah. we're by virtue of just having more wins than everybody else in the division right now so <laughs> which is a better way to do it i guess of course you know i mean it's it, however you get there you know whatever but uh what are the tea leaves telling you guys for this sunday what do you think is uh what do you see how it how is it going to go down i'm sure you guys think feel know that you're going to win on sunday how do you see it happening well, yeah, I mean, we're going to put up 60 points and you guys are only going to score two. Okay. So, uh, you know, no, um, <laughs> it, you know, listen, you said it a few times and, and, you know, I, I'll be honest, I don't follow the Chicago Bears a ton. Um, you know, I just kind of see the highlights. Uh, if the game is on and that's the only one and I don't have kids running around my ankles, I might watch it. Sure. But, um, you know, I find it very interesting. You talk about strength going against strength and this is what we found in the Eagles game as well. It was our strength versus their strength and, 
uh, vice versa on the other side of the ball. So I'm I'm pretty excited to watch this. Yeah, I still have a lot of faith in in whomever is under center, whether it's Fitzpatrick or Jameis. Though I personally am am siding and leaning towards the Jameis side of it. Um, as far as what I think should happen, I think it'll probably wind up being Fitzpatrick. But regardless, whoever it is, I have enough faith in in all of that that uh, you know. Just even from this conversation, I'm just saying, look, it's it, it's the old mantra. Uh, the game is going to be won and lost in the trenches, and so it's whoever wins that the the line of scrimmage. If your defensive line can get in there and they can, uh, you know, they can shut down the passing game, then it's probably gonna gonna lean more towards the Bears. If we can hold up and our offensive line can do their job, which we know they're capable of, and Ren said, you know, we've got at least ten good quarters of football, and eight of those are excellent. Um, then yeah, I think you guys are going to have a hard time outscoring us. Uh, in the end, if you guys want to win, you're going to have to score more points. And I know that sounds stupid. It's just we've been putting up a lot of points. No, I mean I've so, I've I've, I've, I've said that myself many many times, and and I usually reference that when I'm talking about teams like the uh, the Saints. You know yeah. how for years they their job was to outscore their opponent, and, and I know that the object is to score more points than the opponent. I'm just saying that their defense was so bad they would have to put up 40 to outscore the 35 that their defense gave up. And that's actually the one thing that I'm worried about this Sunday is that up to this point, our offense hasn't proven up to the task of scoring points. Right. Um, you know, we scored 24 points against Seattle. Seven, only 17 of that belonged to the offense because we had a touchdown on the defensive side. Same thing with Green Bay, 23 uh, points in that game. Only 16 coming from the offense because we had a pick six from Khalil Mack uh, in that one as well. So it's just uh, and we and we only scored 16 against the the Cardinals in a victory uh, on Sunday. So if we have to get in a shootout with you guys, that's definitely going to go your way. So I mean, the strength against strength has to skew heavily towards the defense of the Bears if we're going to come out on top. Because unless this is the epiphany game for Mitch Trubisky, where he snaps out of it and throws 350 and three touchdowns. What we've seen thus far says we're going to have to keep this low scoring. We're going to have to keep the ball in our hands way longer than you guys have it and, mm-hmm. and, and win a 17 to 14 ball game. Because if we have to win a game 42 or 48 to 40 like you guys won week one, we're not going to be mm-hmm. able to pull that off. I, I mean, and to that point, like I'm, I'm just looking at the numbers right now between the Bears and the, and the Buccaneers. You guys, your offense, or at least your team, has scored 63 points over your first three games. Right. We've scored 102. Right. <laughs> um, you know, so that, that, but your points allowed, your defense has only given up 55 points. Our defense has given up 91. Right. So, uh, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's really just going to come down to that. You know, uh, I, I hate to say whoever scores more points, but I mean, it, I feel like it's going to be a shootout. That's what we're going to hang our hat on. Right. And, uh, you know, Todd Munkin's going to go out there and he's going to play his game. We're, you know, uh, we're, we're going to play what we need to do. And, and I think that's going to be through the air. And, uh, you know, it, we'll, we'll beat you that way. Sure. I mean, you guys have done it to pretty much everyone else. And you almost did it to the Steelers uh, on uh, on Monday, coming back from, from way behind. I think I tuned in. It was 30 to 13. The next thing I know, it's 30 to 27, and you guys have the ball again. So, yeah. I mean, you're definitely capable uh, of putting up big points fast, and that's what has me nervous about the game uh, on Sunday. And it's if, if we have to try to outscore you guys, we have the horses, so I think, I, I think we can do it. It's just we haven't seen them do it yet. Yeah, so. what I'm going to be looking for is this is another litmus test for me for this Buccaneers offense. You know, we went we went up against the Saints, and like you said, you know, 48-40 game. Well, then the Eagles came to town, and the Eagles, you know, I would consider a top five defense. Uh, and we kept Fitzpatrick clean, and when we did, he, you know, he put up points, and we had you know two two score lead late in the fourth quarter, and everything was fine and dandy. Uh, but I don't think the Eagles front four or seven is what you guys have in the bears so yeah. if the bucks can put up you know 27 to 35 offensively no one stopped the bucks offense like all year we stop ourselves sure and if if we can have a game like that against this bears defensive team um i know this sounds stupid uh and you know bears fans will roll their eyes but it's the greatest show on turf all over again Mm-hmm. The problem yeah, is we sure. don't know who's gonna th- we don't know who's gonna throw it. I mean, all our receivers at PFF are in the top five 
are 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 and are and OJ Howard's the top tight end in PFF. I mean, you know, it, it and it's because Fitzpatrick's getting the time and he's just he's just getting the ball in playmakers' hands. Yeah, so I mean that's that's what um and the other thing is, I mean it's it's what had me nervous going into the Seattle game on Monday night was that if you look at the stat sheet, Denver beat the piss out of Seattle from pillar to post, but it was three big plays that Seattle had that kept them in the game. It was a 66-yard pass to their tight end, a 50-yard pass to Tyler Lockett, a 30-yard pass to Brandon Marshall, and what should have probably been a 27-6 to win by the Broncos was a 27-24 nail-biter because of three plays. You know, right. uh, uh, what's his name? Russell Wilson only completed 19 passes but he completed them for over 300 for almost 300 yards and three touchdowns uh, in that game. So, I mean, even though we beat him up on Monday night, it was still a mm-hmm. one score game going into the fourth quarter because our offense just couldn't generate the points that we needed to pull away late uh, from the, from the Seahawks. So, you know, again, if, if, you know, you guys are saying 27 to the 35, you won't need, I don't think you'll need 27 to 35 to win the game against the the offense the way that has been uh, this is the way it's been playing uh thus far i th- i think 21 would be plenty to get a victory with the way our offense has played so far well uh, and after Good the first news couple for us. Yeah, yeah yeah well Sorry. after the first well to be honest like i would normally I, I could see that like you look on the outside looking in but i don't i just don't trust this defense like i i think that you guys will put up at least 24 and it's and you know it it might be it might be the defense's epiphany because you can sort of make excuses about you know going into shells with big leads or you know they shut you know it was just the four turnovers but then you look at the points given up i mean those are the points you've given up and at the end of the day you know you're both saying well you got to outscore the and that's it it's like it doesn't matter what else happens really i mean there's reasons for it but that's it it's how many points you've given up and i'm not like i I am more I think it's more likely that you put up 24 points than we hold you to 17. Right. Okay. Well, as can, a Bucks fan. You know, I would I would be overjoyed to see us score 24 cuz it would be the it would match our our highest scoring total for the season uh thus far. So that would be very interesting. So I mean, and we have and I I've, I've mentioned it on the show before that we have the kind of defense where if we we don't have to we don't have to win win shootouts or, or anything like that. We have the type of defense that right now, or in the first three games anyway, 17 points would be enough to win just about every game we play with the way our defense is played. Um, right. So it, it's carried the offense thus far. But we're going to run into teams like the Buccaneers and things like that where 17 points isn't going to be enough even if the defense has a good day. So, you know, today this is going to be the, the – like all eyes for me are going to be on the offense – and how they respond, um, number one, to the criticism because, you know, it, it's a six in one hand, half a dozen in the other kind of thing right now because on one hand, we're very um, – we're very – we know that we have to be patient. It's year one with a brand-new head coach, a brand-new system, a whole cast of characters playing together for the first time, so there has to be some patience there. On the other hand – this is year six after we let go of Lovey Smith, who got fired for going ten and six, and we haven't come close <laughs> to ten and six since we. Fired Do you guys want him, him back? Do you want him back? No. Cause... Have you seen how he's handling Illinois? No, I'm I'm just I fine. With, I have. Uh, and I've seen not to beard. mention that that old man river beard that he's sporting these days. I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't know if his wife uh, left Papa him Smurf? or something Papa, or what's Papa going Smurf? on there. He's working on a Frederick Douglass beard down there or something <laughs> like that. It's just it's not a good look. You know, Lovey's a decent looking guy, and I don't know what's going on with the beard. I don't know what that is. But, you know, it's year six after Lovey Smith. And we're out of patience as far as wanting this football team to win while needing to exhibit patience with this offense and, and everything. So it's like I've, I've said on the show, it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Because on, on one hand, Dr. Jekyll, you want to be patient. You realize that you have to be patient. On the other hand, Hyde just wants to see touchdowns and points and victories. And he wants it to make it look easy, especially with that defense that we, have our, that we offer now. So it's, um, it's, it's tough uh, being a fan. Uh, these days we had such high expectations going in and then adding Khalil Mack to the mix only raised the expectations more and and here we are 
not quite meeting them the way that we wanted to thus far. Two and one, leading division. Yeah, so you can't argue with uh, with the results for the most part, uh, but yeah, I mean, we've already got more conference wins la- uh, right now than we had all of last year. So, and that's uh, two. We got we beat. <laughs> We beat Carolina. That was our one NFC victory last year. We went 0-6 in the division, and uh, we've beaten Seattle and uh, Arizona. So we got two NFC wins already, doubling John Fox's total of 2017. So that's how bad it was <laughs> last year. We're the defending AFC North champs, though. We went undefeated against the AFC North uh, last right. year. So we have that, but uh, otherwise not a good year in 2017. So Who are you guys playing this year? Are you playing us? We got the, the NFC South. We got the East, uh, the AFC East, and the NFC West. Yeah. So, oh well. And we got Tampa Bay and the Giants as our same place opponents. Gotcha. Because okay. we all gloriously finished in fourth place last year. So there you go. Yeah. So <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, and and you know, I've got a feeling just kind of watching how the season is shaping out. It it feels like in some cases, and it may be isolated to this year. It may go beyond this year. It feels like the NFL is finally starting to write itself and switch. And, you know, those teams that have been uh, pretty good perennially, um, you know, are finding themselves in less than pretty good spots right now. And yeah. those of us who have finished in fourth the last couple of years, you know, we're I know it's still early in the season, but uh, it's what it kind of looks like so far. I mean, God, you look, you guys, us, Miami, uh, you know, a bunch of different teams, the Jaguars still continue in their role from last year yeah uh you know so for for whatever it is man i i gotta tell you i wouldn't mind seeing you guys again uh for the nfc playoffs um you know i I would love to see those of us teams you know flip the script here in the nfl and uh you know we take over for a while well i'm i'm all with you on that one there i mean it would definitely be uh interesting to to talk to you guys again uh in january previewing previewing a, a wild card divisional uh, matchup at, at some point. I mean, well, just doing a playoff game would be great uh, right. for me because this is uh, <laughs> oh, year do. number year number twelve for me doing the show. I've been doing uh-huh. the show since two thousand seven, and um, I've had uh, one playoff season, two thousand ten. That was it. Haven't been back yeah. to the playoffs in in the in this my twelfth season doing the show. Just the one time in twenty ten, and we of course lost the NFC Championship game to Green Bay. <laughs> We have we have one Bucks podcast who's been doing it. This is his thirteenth season, and he yeah. has never seen a playoff. So wow, yeah, wow. yeah. We have the longest streak in the NFL for not being in the playoffs. So thanks to Buffalo making it last year, they they've handed yes. the reins over to you now, huh? Yes, yes, yes. They they ship they ship the trophy down. Nice. Looks good. I, I think the Browns. I think the Browns are still have still been out of it long mm. enough. But we are definitely the longest NFC team. Sure, sure, um, sure, sure. So sure, okay. Well, gents, uh, I appreciate you taking the time, and um, we will. Uh, I know we're all looking forward to the game uh, on Sunday to see how everything is going to uh, shake out. Because, like we've said a couple of times, this is a far more interesting matchup than it was when we talked over the summer. Um, you know, with uh, with everything that's happened with Fitz Magic and everything, and then us adding Khalil Mack, which made a good defense even better, kind of thing. There's there's uh, there's high stakes with both our teams, and uh, look forward to see what's going to go down on Sunday. Sounds good. We're looking forward to it. Rindex, yeah, I, go ahead. What's up? No, I was just <laughs> going to close it out, but you interrupted me, so go ahead and say your final <laughs> remarks there, Ren. Uh, do you tweet during the game? Sometimes. Are you a game tweeter? I, I sometimes? do. Sometimes I'm sitting there, and I'm so wrapped up in the replay that by the time I'm done with my tweet, we're like three plays down the road or something like that, so gotcha. um, you know, sometimes I think I should probably do it with my laptop because I can type on a computer faster than i can my stubby fingers can type on a smartphone but uh i just don't want that thing in my way i might kick it over at some point during the game uh and what have you but uh you know i was I just try. thinking about i was just thinking about throwing jabs back and forth during the oh, game. oh yeah we I, can we can do that you want to throw jabs let's throw jabs we can do that and okay. uh just don't ask me I to bet on the game I, I can't be on buck's twitter like it's it's too reactive for me sure. it is sure yeah yeah, jabs, yeah. no problem with jabs, but if, you know, like I'm trying to make commentary on the play that just got run, and the next thing I know, we're two plays down the trough, and my, my tweet doesn't mean it. I don't know how those reporters do it, you know? I mean, I oh, know that they, there's they, a delay. They have, like a, they have like a minute and a half head start. Yeah, something like that. It's like, geez. No, it is. The, the delay is really that long. Wow, okay. 
Well, uh, maybe so, yeah. not a minute and a half, but it's about it's about forty five seconds yeah. for sure. So, but it, it's uh, it's kind of crazy how how quickly they're they're on top of those things. But um, yeah, so jab away, man. That's good. I think you guys follow me anyway, so we're we're good yeah. on that. So uh, we'll see what kind of uh, what noise we can stir up on uh, Sunday. And I uh, appreciate you guys coming back on, and uh, we look forward to doing it again. Yeah, let's do it, man. Hopefully in in January this time. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, Brent Allen. Ren Dax from the PewterCast podcast, helping us preview week four between the Bears and the Bucks. As always, I want to thank my guests, Brent Allen, Ren Dax from the PewterCast podcast. Uh, you know, a couple of great guys really enjoyed uh, talking to them. And, you know, guys like them and pretty much every every guest we have on the show is why I started having guests. You guys have heard me say this uh, before, but I, I always like to to reinforce it. It just, you know, it's clear listening to them that they love their team the way that we love ours. And, and, and that's what I want. So, I mean, even though our, our allegiances are not the same, we're all speaking the same language. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's a universal thing. Uh, when, when, you, when you have a shared love for something, even if that something isn't the same thing, you, you know what I'm saying? It's, uh, you, you definitely get to have somewhat of a, a kinship, if you will, uh, with those people, which is why I love uh, having the guests on the show, uh, finding the right people to be on the show. And, and it's been uh, nothing but a pleasant experience for me doing that. And uh, you guys seem to love it as well. So... There you go. So um, uh, everybody's winning on this one. So um, after we got done with that uh, very lengthy interview, I hope you're all still here. Um, Ren and, and Brent talked to me about being on what they call their Instacast, which is r- basically right after the game. They go live uh, online to, to kind of do a basically a, like a knee jerk reaction uh, type show. Uh, they asked me to uh, to be on. So I'm hoping that uh, I will be able to rub some salt in some sad wounds uh, as the Bears send the Buccaneers flying back to Florida with a 2-2 two and two record, and we go into the bye with a 3-1 and one, uh, record. Um, but I am, uh, I am worried about this, uh, about this team, uh, about their ability to, to strike fast and strike big uh, with the plays combined with our inability to get a rhythm going uh, on the offensive side. Uh, of the football or, or to do, have a consistent rhythm. I mean, one drive here and then we go stagnant for four drives in a row and then maybe we put something together and put a field goal on the board. I don't want to have to rely on the defense to score points. That's supposed to be, you know, the chair. That's supposed to be the the, the frosting on the cake, uh, if you will. You know, that's supposed to be the sprinkles on the ice cream. It's like it, that. It's supposed to be extra that, you know, not so, we're not supposed to depend on the points that our defense supplies us. So, um, you know, as, as much as that would definitely turn the tables against a team like Tampa Bay, I don't want to have to rely on those to win the game. You know, I want to get the, the, you know, the pick six or the fumble recovery or, you know, something like that to to put them away, not to to uh, to, you know, to make the difference in, in winning or losing. You know what I mean? So, um you know, and when we talked about the uh, the, the injury report uh, just before the the interview, there, you notice that uh, two of the names the, on the top of the list there were defensive backs, our corners actually, uh, Pritz and Mukamura, and his backup Marcus Cooper having practiced this week with hamstring injuries, which means we're most looking most likely looking at Kevin Tolliver starting uh, on, on Sunday, or maybe we'll have Bryce Callahan move to the outside and, and Tolliver will be the slot guy. Maybe that's something that Vic Fangio uh, will do as far as uh, sh- shifting those guys uh, around. So we'll see how that all goes. But having an undrafted rookie free agent going head-to-head with guys like um, Deshaun Jackson and, uh, and, and Vince uh, – is it Vince Evans? Evans. Evans, the wide receiver. I think it's Evans. Vince Evans, whatever. I'm, I'm blanking on his name for right now. Uh, it is Evans. I know that for sure. <laughs> I can't remember his first name for some reason. But anyway, you know, going against studs like that uh, and also having to worry about a tight end like O.J. Howard and then uh, they have a tight end Brent. That's really good uh, as well. Um, you know, and they don't have much of a running game, so they're going to make their difference throwing 
uh, the football on Sunday, and, and hopefully we're up to the task. A, you know, we had the conversation about pass protection. You know, is it more three step boom, get the ball out because Evans and 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 Jackson are are fast enough receivers to be able to 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 get downfield in three steps. Uh, you know, or has the pass protection really been protecting while uh, the quarterback goes through his progressions? Whoever it's going to be, whether it be Winston or um, or Fitzmagic uh, on Sunday, we'll have to wait and see who it is. I just hope that the Bears can get to him and disrupt it and uh, make it more of a first half against Pittsburgh uh, as opposed to the 60 minutes he had against New Orleans or, uh, you know, hitting a 75 yard touchdown on the first play from scrimmage against Philadelphia. Uh, week number two, things like that, or the, or you know, scoring twenty-one points in the second half uh, to almost win the game against Pittsburgh on Monday night. I mean, it was a valiant comeback that they made, where it was self-inflicted wounds that beat them. So, you know, maybe the that's what the Bears need to do is follow the blueprint that the Steelers made and uh, take advantage of that as much as they possibly can. They managed to put up, I think, all thirty points in the second quarter because four turnovers from the Buccaneers helped put those points on the board. So we got to get after them. And then on on the offensive side, you know, we we talked about strength against strength with our defense and their offense. I think the matchup to truly watch this week will be our offense against their defense. Can we establish a rhythm? Can we run the football? Can we throw, you know, can Trubisky be better? That's the real question. Can he be better? Can he be the guy that, you know, all summer, all week, all season long last year, we just wished we could find somebody for him to throw the football to? Somebody that would be a difference maker, a playmaker for him. Well, we went out and we signed three of them, and then we drafted another one to go along with Adam Shaheen and and, and Cohen and and Howard coming out of the backfield, and, and yet we're not seeing everything that we want to from this quarterback that we all adored last year. So... Can he be better? Can he shake off the whatever funk he's in right now and, and go out there and, and, and make a difference and be able to make the throws and not miss Taylor Gabriel if he's wide open down the seam for a third week in a row? Uh, things like that. I mean, that's what we're looking for it is uh, more consistency, better decisions, better throws uh, from Trubisky. And uh, if he can do that, if we can keep the football out of Tampa Bay's hands, we definitely want to be on the right side of time of possession uh, this week if Tampa Bay wins the time of possession we lose the game plain and simple because if that offense has the ball more and our defense is on the field having to chase those guys for more than we're not that's going to spell a bad afternoon and a very sad conversation for me when I do the instacast with those guys after the game uh, on Sunday so that is basically how uh, I see it going down it's it's up to our offense I think more than anything to determine whether or not we're going to win this game even Brent and Wren even said so there towards the end of the interview. They're expecting the Bears to be able to score points. The problem is, or the question is, can we score more than Tampa Bay? You guys have heard me have this conversation or, or mentioned this many, many times about how some teams with, with lousy offense or lousy defenses literally have to outscore their opponents. You know, we know that sounds silly when you say that, and that's the object of the game, but. You know, when your defense is giving up 35 and you got to score 40 to win every single week, that's the definition of having to outscore your opponents as, as opposed to, you know, winning the game. You know, that's kind of how it, it, it just kind of shakes out. And, you know, I don't want to I don't want the Bears to have to outscore Tampa Bay this weekend. I want us to just beat Tampa Bay. That's how I want it to be. So, you know, hopefully the defense can do its thing and, and keep going on uh, with what they've been doing, getting after the quarterback, causing disruption, causing turnovers to give the football back to our offense. And I hope that our offense can uh, put some long, sustained drives together, run the football a little bit more, uh, be a bit more consistent with the passing game, moving the chains, keeping the ball out of Tampa Bay's hands. And I think that's our road uh, to victory. So, I mean, we just... Keep doing what we're doing on defense, and we need to be better and more consistent on offense. And I think we can do it. I definitely believe that we can. Will we? That's the question. So uh, that will do it for the week four preview episode of the Bears Talk Underground. Uh, Be sure and uh, keep your eyes on Twitter after the game. I'll uh, I'll retweet or or, or whatever I can the uh, Instacast information so you guys can uh, get a listen to that. 
Um, and, and hopefully it will be a happy conversation on our side of things about uh, we're talking about a bear victory instead of, you know, explaining from my perspective what I thought went wrong in the game against Tampa Bay. So keep an eye out for that and uh, be sure to come back on Monday night. Hopefully we'll be talking about our third straight victory episode and, and all the fun things that go along with that. So until then, my name is Larry D and this has been the Bears Talk Underground.